So, uh, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to open this STARS seminar and introduce uh, Jurgos Venizelos' book entitled Populism in Power, Discourse and Performativity in Syriza and Donald Trump. Uh, Jurgos, can you please just uh, show us the book, uh, mm -hmm. the copy that we can... Okay, so this is the book mm -hmm. we are going to talk about just uh, to introduce you. Um, Jorgos, he is a postdoctoral fellow in political polarization at the Democracy Institute of the Central European University in Budapest. His research is situated at the intersection of contemporary political theory and comparative politics with a special focus on populism and anti-populism. He has previously researched and thought at the University of Cyprus, Aristotle University of Thessaloniki and Cyprus University of Technology. Uh, he authored the book we are going to talk about, and he has published extensively in journals, including Political Studies, Constellations, Critical Sociology, and Representation. He co-convinced the, uh, the Populist uh, Specialist Group of the Political Studies uh, Association. So, uh, Jorgos, the floor is yours. You have uh, more or less uh, 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Camila, for... Uh... Uh, the introduction and uh, thanks very much, uh, Stals, for uh, for hosting uh, this uh, book presentation and of course uh, Camila and Paul uh, for agreeing to <clears throat> uh, act as uh, commentators or or discussions. I think I couldn't think of any better uh, people to serve this uh, purpose today uh, in in uh, Stals. So uh, let me just share a few words about how this idea uh, started uh, to write the book. Uh, it was um, 2011, uh, 2012, um, populist movements uh, on the left in Southern Europe uh, were rising. Uh, they were kind of different than uh, the normal left. Uh, they were contending for power, uh, series specifically uh, achieved power. So I had this uh, first initial idea, uh, what happens when, when these guys uh, go, go to power? And I tried to pursue it as a PhD um, uh, project, and I was looking for a, a second case. Um, and um, I was wondering which uh, which case I would uh, I wanted to uh, to involve. Of course, it's Latin America to look at, but uh, uh, you know I think it was uh, quite uh, well researched. So some people were uh, telling me, but look what's uh, happening on the right. There's Trump, Donald Trump uh, rising. Um, I, I wasn't very sure if he was populist or not, but anyways, I took the risk uh, to uh, propose his uh, provocative. Uh, uh, comparison between these two very different, of course, um, uh, uh, projects, very different discourses, very different politics, very different ideologies with very different implications uh, uh, for democracy. And I started uh, reading the literature on, on populism in power, or actually populism, there's no specific literature on populism in power. Let's assume that uh, it's just a literature on populism. And there, there are some uh, um, quite a few assumptions actually on, on, on populism and power, what happens uh, when populists go, go to power. And you can see very briefly uh, the main, uh, the key assumptions. So uh, populists uh, are thought to be a force of the opposition, meaning that they cannot exist in government. Uh, populism in power always necessarily turn uh, authoritarian or on the contrary they might turn uh, mainstream and lastly uh, another assumption is that they will fail whatever that means whatever failure means uh, in general or uh, to implement policy uh, and so on and so forth uh, I was quite puzzled with these um, with these uh, assumptions because populism doesn't have to be authoritarian, populism doesn't have to go mainstream, uh, and as we know from Latin America, populism in power can surely be a thing. So uh, I tried to make a sense of these uh, of these uh, assumptions, and in the first chapter of the book, I, I create a which. Is uh, dedicated on theory, I created a taxonomy of approaches, and I divide these approaches uh, uh, in two. Basically, each uh, each category has uh, two subcategories. First category, uh, I call it the outcome-focused approaches. 
and second on policy with approaches and you know what it means exactly so uh outcome uh first um, uh, assumptions show that there is this perception that there's an outcome uh for populism itself so when populists go go to power uh, they are not uh, durable, they are not sustainable, they will be integrated into the mainstream and so on and so forth. Because as we see from the second quote, these are like very key uh, famous quotes in the literature, uh, populists succeed in the opposition and they do well at the game of elections, but uh, when in power, uh, their structural weaknesses are very well known. But on the other hand, it's not just um, outcomes for populism, but outcomes that populism has on democracy and its institutions. So uh, Mueller and, and Papas, uh, they think that populism in power means uh, assault to the institutions, uh, intimidations of, uh, on political enemies, uh, and therefore uh, assaults on, uh, on liberal democracy uh, in general. So within this outcome uh, focused approach, um, we see that there is an element of uh, a professed incompatibility between populism and power and um, on the contrary, uh, an element of compatibility. Uh, but still, uh, I, I, I don't agree uh, with, these, uh, with these assumptions and I, I, I problematize them. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to this later though. For now, I'm gonna move to the uh, policy focus approaches where you see again that there is this uh, twofold element of uh, incompatibility versus compatibility. Um, so, uh, policy focus approaches, uh, of course, focus on a populist's uh, ability to um, implement uh, policy or not. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we have some key scholars saying uh, that populists, uh, when they get into power, uh, uh, their inability to live up to their promises will be relieved. Uh, they cannot uh, establish uh, or articulate clearly their, their vision. And on the contrary, uh, uh, there are people who say, no, no, actually they can do draft policy like normal political actors. And I think both cases uh, are correct, but uh, the reason I, I scrutinize this approach is that uh, drawing back on uh, the theory of, of populism or let's say the, the political scientific uh, uh, side of the debate where we uh, tend to see populism not as policy, but as you know, people centrism and anti-elitism. Uh, I think these approaches uh, move the, the, the attention away from these people centrism, anti-elitism and towards the policy that often comes uh, with, um, with uh, uh, populism. Therefore, uh, populist ability to implement policy is kind of taken as the name of, of, of uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, populist ability to, to act uh, in power and implement, uh, and implement uh, uh, policy. But as we know, uh, non-populists also fail to implement policy. So I think there is still some uh, conceptual uh issue there and why if we have this uh uh operational consensus this uh, agreement that uh populists uh, uh, exhibit this uh, uh profound focus on uh, people centrism and anti-elitism why do we disagree as to their direction when they go into power and the key argument here is that because of anti-populism uh, others have uh, researched uh, this uh, this topic uh, extensively, uh, but uh, I, I draw on on, on anti-populism to show that uh, because of the way populism is thought to begin with, so as something that is equated with authoritarianism or the far right and nativism, something that is uh, almost synonymous with uh, demagogy uh, and irresponsibility, something that is not a normal phenomenon, something that is mystified and very exceptional. If, if you have this uh, basis as a starting point for any discussion about populism, then when it comes to populism in power, of course, uh, one's uh, expectations are, are negative. And that's one of the key uh, theoretical uh, arguments. And my proposition uh, in this book is that to rethink populism in power, we have to first rethink populism 
uh, itself and return back to the operational uh, definition, the people versus the elite, but not just, uh, you know, as, as, as words. Um, uh, the people and the elite are not just words and uh, populism uh, in power uh, is not just like its contents uh, or, or its outcomes. So the proposition is to move uh, towards uh, um, populism function. What does it mean? It means what does populism do? Uh, and the argument here is that populism, uh, the way it, it performs itself, uh, its dy uh, dynamic style and, and performativity is uh, very crucial for constructing uh, a collective uh, identity. And I draw a lot theoretically on uh, Ostigi and um, uh, Moffitt, La Clau, the Essex School, and, and so on and so forth on these like uh, discursive, performative and sociocultural approaches to highlight that uh, the people versus the elite uh, is, is not just about words, as I just said, uh, it's, it's about, um, you know, uh, mobilizing, uh, interpolating and constructing uh, a collective subject, the people, through transgression, uh, through uh, emotions, through symbols, uh, through uh, sounds, um, and so on and so forth. So, uh, in general, um, I see uh, populism as, uh, as a collective identity based on affect, uh, founded on, on, on style, uh, and so on and so forth. And um, the idea is that if you approach populism uh, like this, through discourse, performativity and, and identification, then the questions uh, to ask uh, when one focuses in, on, on populism in power is whether populists keep this populist style, uh, understood as discourse, performativity, do they still articulate and perform people's centrism and anti-elitism in the institutions? What about collective affects? Do they continue to mobilize uh, emotions? Uh, are they antagonistic within the institutions? Do they uh, continue to claim that they are not the elites, but they, they, they are the, the representatives of the, of the people? This is the main, uh, approach. And um, as, as I already said, I compare Sears and Donald Trump, very different cases, one on the left, one on the right, USA is superpower, Greece a semi-peripheral uh, country. But uh, besides these uh, differences, I think there are also many uh, similarities. And of course, these differences uh, may affect uh, uh, comparisons in, in terms of uh, comparative uh, politics, but you know, uh, these populists are already in power and they, uh, they have already won uh, uh, the state even against uh, theoretical and scientific um, uh, expectations and their discourse and performativity continues in a way to affect uh, uh, what people think. So uh, there are uh, very many similarities as well. As I mentioned, they are populists in power at the national level, not the subnational level that uh, literature on populism has uh, pretty much focused on before the, um, uh, the neoliberal crisis of 2008. Uh, they both have some key characteristics. They perform on the low. They have transgressive style and populist discourse. Of course, uh, as you see from the book, uh, the quality of these similarities are very different. Uh, and at the same time, when politicians, journalists and experts uh, talk to them, talk about them, sorry, uh, they use the label populist uh, to denounce them, to frame them as, as dangers uh, to democracy. And of course, uh, I even found uh, very ironically some, some, some articles um, uh, from 2015 and 16, putting um, the two actors in the same um, uh, story, uh, framing them as uh, one of the same and so on and so forth. So even from the point of view of uh, uh, populism uh, studies, you know, like focusing on these characteristics that we consider populist, uh, but also from the uh, point of view of, of the experts, of the anti-populist experts, there is this agreement, paradoxically, that they are all uh, populists. So uh, focusing on this, uh, on, on, on language uh, and aesthetics and taking this approach that I just as mentioned, uh, when approaching my uh, uh, cases, I wanted to focus on, on their very style, on their 
uh, the way they speak, uh, the way they behave in, in places, uh, in political places uh, where uh, politicians uh, usually uh, per perform. And as you might get uh, a, an idea seeing these pictures, um, you know, and, and taking specifically a very Ostigian uh, perspective, uh, we see a style that is kind of transgressive to the uh, normative. And Donald Trump has weird handshakes uh, and expressions, as uh, uh, experts uh, say. He even has a, a Wikipedia page about his handshakes. And on the other hand, like Syriza, uh, uh, especially like Varoufakis with his funky uh, shirt, uh, or uh, going to work with a motorbike and a backpack, or um, Pavlos Polakis on uh, top right. Uh, you know, like they're misbehaving in in places that they have to. Uh, quote unquote, uh, behave like normal uh, politicians. I'm not going to say uh, a lot about uh, uh, data, but uh, yeah, um, I collected, um, I can't remember, oh, yeah, here's the numbers, uh, lots of uh, speeches, uh, posters, videos. Uh, I conducted in depth uh, interviews uh, with activists uh, in the US and Greece. Uh, and I also uh, went to various rallies and um, uh, and protests in, in in both countries and during field work. Uh, the the idea uh, is that the first two methods uh, that's very uh, political scientific. Uh, the first two methods uh, focus on the way uh, populists uh, perform. Uh, do they supply this populist communication uh, in power as a in opposition? And the last two methods. Uh, kind of examine um, whether this discourse still works or what, what are the, the emotions uh, are highlighted in people's uh, uh, narratives. Do they still identify with the, their leaders? Do they still, uh, or do they, or do they, um, you know, are they alienated? And uh, if their leaders uh, um, are not as good as they expected, how do they justify uh, failure? Of course, the book uh, has a, a comparison between uh, uh, the opposition and the power phase in both cases. So there's a within case uh, comparison um, before we arrive to the uh, in uh, comparison between the two cases. But uh, for uh, time, for reasons related with time, I'm only going to focus here on, on, on the in power uh, phase. First case, uh, series in power. What does it do in terms of discourse performativity and uh, identification? Um, here I use a few uh, images uh, because it's, uh, uh, I think, more appealing, more easy to uh, to follow in, instead of using uh, just uh, words. Uh, in the case of Syriza, as I said, uh, we see that uh, the populist uh, master frame or the populist style as, as defined earlier, as defined by the uh, bibliography, is kind of still in place. Uh, Tsipras in a pub very casually on the top picture, uh, watching football. Um, uh, bottom picture, he's wearing a basketball uh, jersey in his office. But this does not mean that populism is the only thing that uh, exists in their communication. Uh, in power, uh, we see populists being articulated with non-populist frames, and sometimes these populist and non-populist frames, uh, they, 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 they are articulated together, they are brought together, and even non-populist uh, frames, like technocratic frames, are paradoxically uh, in a very contradictory uh, manner uh, trying uh, are tried to be uh, communicated in a, in a populist way as well. So some of the frames uh, I identified and uh, you can find in the second chapter on, on Trump in the book is patriotic articulations, uh, technocratic articulations. Uh, I left this frame towards the the end of uh, series as. Um, uh, series as uh, term in office and another frame. Um, 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 arguing that uh, the, the, the leftist government has led um, the, the country outside the surveillance uh, of uh, the Miranda. Just to give an example of how non-populist uh, frames can be um, combined with populist frames, uh, I was in this um, uh, rally uh, towards uh, uh, the end of Syriza's uh, term in office where uh, Syriza was... Um, uh, Tsipras was uh, advertisement, advertising his uh, his achievement to lead the country outside the memoranda, uh, which was a frame on its own. 
but then at the same time he was saying uh, let's not allow the, uh, the the dark forces of the establishment to come back to power and uh, uh, diminish the will of the people. That's just uh, an example, but we can talk more about uh, different examples later. Um, uh, Donald Trump in power, again, uh, I see uh, a very similar uh, style against uh, against uh, theoretical uh, expectations. You see his populist uh, style, his transgression to continue pursuing in power. This is evident not just uh, in his discourse, but also, uh, I mean, yeah, in his uh, Twitter and um, uh, social media accounts, which are considered, of course, as a as proxies of discourse, as a broader uh, broader uh, ne network of uh, of uh, production of, of meaning. So uh, we see Donald Trump uh, presenting himself as a fighter, as a Rocky Balboa. These pictures he uh, uh, uploaded himself or his uh, uh, team, but that's not uh, fake. Uh, in the second picture, we see Nancy Pelosi, uh, the establishment surrounded by the people. She is uh, tearing up the 2020 State of the Union speech uh, that Trump uh, addressed to the nation. Uh, and in a way, she's betraying the common people uh, who Trump invited uh, uh, to honor that day. And this is one of the, I think, um, key points here that these people are not, most of them are not famous. They are just like common people. Uh, and of course, that was like a strategic uh, thing by Trump. But then again, uh, Trump's populism, uh, while it is present, it is articulated with uh, other frames. And as I, as I show in the book, these other frames are at times uh, much more and uh, dominant and present than, uh, uh, you know, like uh, Trump's conservatism or the white nationalist elements uh, that we see also in his supporters. Uh, or the anti-leftist uh, narrative towards the end of his office might even be more prominent uh, than his uh, populism. So then again, we go back to some um, uh, conceptual issues in terms of how much right-wing populism is populism and, uh, or whether um, the right-wing element of the conservative element or the nationalist and nativist element is, is much more uh, important. Uh, moving now uh, towards uh, uh, the issue of affects and emotions or collective identity. Um, as I said, I, um, I conducted uh, uh, ethnographic research in the, in the two countries to explore uh, people's narratives and, and emotions and went to various uh, uh, places like occupied factories that uh, were, of course, uh, they did not belong to Syriza, these constituencies, but they did vote for Syriza. Uh, in, uh, in in 2012 or 2015, and uh, one could see uh, uh, that people were quite alienated uh, from the Syriza project. Uh, but um, uh, in Trump's case, that was the opposite. And uh, even if some uh, experts uh, frame Trump's uh, term in office as uh, like most catastrophic. Uh, uh, presidency in the history of the United Nations and uh, Trump is the most ignorant president, so on and so forth. Uh, what uh, I saw and what like uh, people can also uh, observe in various uh, uh, documentaries or videos is that uh, uh, to a great extent, this ecstatic identification with Trump still existed. And uh, that's a, a photo from a, an Evangelicals for Trump event. Uh, I went um there was a big uh, uh you know like uh, an ecstatic uh, atmosphere uh, with live music and, uh, and 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 songs and prayers uh, but that was like a very highly political and polarizing uh event or preachers were talking about uh, against hillary clinton like against uh, the establishment and uh, people were praying and dancing and uh there was almost like this confusion which i mentioned in the book as to who was uh, him or who was the Lord, uh, was it was it a God, a Christian God, their God, uh, or whatever, or was it uh, Trump, their their political leader? And when I mentioned when when I I found this uh, when I saw this contradiction and I mentioned it to one of the interviewees, uh, she was uh, shocked because this was not supposed to be the case um, according to her uh, Christian uh, values. And towards a conclusion now. Um, 
my comparative uh, findings uh, show that uh, against um, uh, theoretical expectations, populist discourse and performativity might as well continue in government. Uh, so populism in, in power defined as such uh, can be can be a thing uh, in power. Uh, this doesn't mean that populism remains uh, a uh, unchanged in power. I show in the book that uh, depending on time uh, and space, so when uh, populism is articulated, what is the conjuncture, uh, what, what political uh, developments are unfolding uh, nationally or internationally, and where it is performed, is it performed at a rally uh, discourse, is it performed in a national or international arena? These things uh, play a key role in uh, uh, in uh, in the style of populism, the intensity of populism, uh, uh, and show uh, in a way that populism reinvents uh, itself, also by bringing in uh, new elements, new frames, new ideas, new narratives. Uh, yes, populists uh, can last until their end, uh, at the end of their term. Uh, in office, and uh, as we saw, that was like a side side finding. As we saw, they can also uh, uh, police. But the key thing that comes up uh, by studying uh, discourses about the people and against uh, the elite um, is that ideology does matter and plays a, a very key uh, uh, role in, uh, in 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 these movements. Uh, in these parties, uh, in these two actors uh, specifically, and then distinguishes them um, between left and right or progressive and reactionary. Uh, and of course, uh, their ideology might have distinct impact on democracy and, and, and society. And the key uh, takeaway from this uh, uh, argument on ideology is that perhaps uh, instead of uh, looking for what happens uh, to society and democracy politics when populists are in power uh, and focusing on populism, we should perhaps focus on, on the ideology that comes uh, with those we call populists, because perhaps they're not even populists. And finally, uh, affect, a very uh, central element in, in, in this book. Uh, I show that it works in a paradoxical and contradictory manners. Um, and I think this is how uh, affect an identity works is not uh, it's not problematic for me that it works in a paradoxical and contradictory way because uh, we saw that uh, Syriza did pass some uh, uh, policy aimed to address the marginalized uh, sectors of society, but because of its failure to uh, um, cancel austerity and, and neoliberalism, um, it didn't it almost it didn't matter. Uh, that it was trying to be an honest uh, governmental uh, actor. While on the other hand, uh, Trump was considered to be catastrophic, as I said, but then we see uh, euphoric support um, towards the end of his uh, office. He even um, his, his um, uh, supporters have been stormed in the, the, uh, the capital, uh, which is not uh, necessarily indicative of how much support he gets, but uh, you know what is important to see to see here is uh, is is uh, <clears throat> uh, mobilization of uh, of emotions of hatred uh, that are uh, very much rooted in 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 this uh, political uh, um, actor. And uh, finally, uh, truth and reason, uh, numbers and statistics are not the most important things in in, in politics because af uh, affect. Uh, uh, you know, doesn't often uh, account for this thing, and this is uh, what politics uh, is about uh, to to a big uh, extent. So I'm gonna leave this uh, here, I think, and we can uh, continue uh, in the discussion. Thank you very much for uh, listening to me. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jorgos, for the presentation. And uh, now I would like to ask uh, Professor Blocker to uh, to make his comments. But before I just introduce him for those who, who don't know him. So Professor uh, Blocker is a full professor at the Department of Sociology and Business Law at the University of Bologna. 
Uh, he has a doctorate from the European University Institute, and his research interests include the sociology of constitutional law and of human rights, constitutional change, constitutional and political imaginary, civic participation, and populism in particular, but not only in the context of Central uh, Eastern Europe. And he's a member of the editorial collective of the Joanna Social Imaginaries and of the book series Social Imaginaries for Roman and Littlefield. He's a co-editor of the European Journal of Cultural and Political Sociology an official journal of the European Sociological Association. He's also a member of the International Advisory Board of European Journal of so Social Theory. Uh, so, uh, Professor Blocker, uh, the floor is yours, and you have around 15 minutes to, to leave your comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. I actually expected to be the second uh, discussion, so I was a bit surprised, but doesn't matter. I hope Camilla is not upset. Uh, or the two Camilas are not upset. Uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me uh, in this discussion. Um, and this is definitely uh, an important book uh, with an important focus, I think, that is uh, populism and power. Um, and also, I mean, one of the things that speaks to me a lot is the, the emphasis on discourse, discourse analysis, in a way, uh, a, a more qualitative approach to populism that I certainly feel affinities with. Uh, and there's also the dimension, I think, that remains um, uh, mind-boggling in many ways, that is uh, populism, populists coming to power uh, on the basis of a, a dramatically anti-establishment type of ticket, uh, uh, so to speak. And well, I live in Italy, as you might, uh, uh, might know, uh, and uh, it's particularly dramatic sometimes to see populists in ministerial positions, et cetera, but then still playing the game of being part of what uh, what uh, is normally called the ordinary people, whatever that is. Um, but of course, I can't only um, uh, applaud the book. Uh, I suppose my role is also to be critical. And of course, I need to start with what is perhaps the, uh, the largest defect of the book, and that is it doesn't mention my work at all. <laughs> so that's the original sin, <laughs> but I won't hold that uh, entirely against you um, because I, I found a number of other issues and they, in a way, they relate to my work, of course, that I think might need uh, uh, further uh, elaboration. Uh, the first thing is really to what extent is uh, a discussion of populism in government really uh, that original? To what extent isn't this sufficiently studied. I'm not entirely sure. It seems to me sometimes that particularly political scientists and their work on populism, they operate in a kind of bubble and they forget about other discussions also uh, in the past that have been had on populism. You mentioned, for instance, uh, discussions on Latin America. There's a huge literature on long uh, decade-long, century-long experiences uh, with populism in power, uh, with all kinds, I think, of, of really important implications, uh, which I did not necessarily see coming back in your discussion. Like, for instance, a, a classical case like Venezuela puts a lot of really important questions on the table. That is, left-wing populists coming to power on a ticket of uh, inclusion of addressing minorities, of addressing marginalization, uh, discussing politics in terms of participatory democracy, but then when coming into power, increasingly manifesting themselves as authoritarians. Uh, I mean, there are an, a whole bunch of cases like this that I think might have had um, more extensive discussion also in their uh, I come uh, uh, back to my work, but also Giuseppe's uh, recent really important book. Um, this also relates then to issues about being in power and what you then do. Uh, and one of the dimensions there is, of course, the constitutional dimension. Uh, what do you do to the architecture of the democratic state as a populist? Um, and so there, I think uh, there could have been more <coughs> discussion. Uh, there's also another uh, lens and a whole uh, a huge literature that I, I thought might have been addressed more. And that is, of course, on the, the European side, particularly East and um, 
uh, Eastern and Central Europe. Uh, of course, we could open up a separate debate on is Orban really a populist uh, or would Kaczynski really be a populist? Uh, there is some mention on that in the in the first chapter, I think. Sure, sure. But uh, of course, I, I, my argument course, yeah. would be that there might have been a, a slightly more systematic uh, engagement, particularly because here, also here, we're talking about cases where we see a rather lengthy um, experience with populism in power. Um, and then uh, again, coming back to the current populist discussion, uh, I'm sometimes a bit puzzled about indeed, not only political science, only talking about political science, but also political science, forgetting about all the debates. I mean, I did a PhD in Romania. Uh, I still think it holds that early uh, 1990s in Romania had populists in power. Uh, but those populists are hardly discussed anymore today. Mm -hmm. They had a huge uh, impact on the construction of the Romanian democratic state, uh, but we tend to forget about them. And um, coming back again to the original sin, I co-edited the book with Manuel Anselmi on the Italian case called Multiple Populisms. And I also think the Italian case ought to be uh, of core interest to anyone writing on populism in power. I mean, Italy has had, uh, and that's also why we call the book Multiple Populisms, a range of experiences with populists in power, doing things like Berlusconi that Trump has repeated, but not invented in many ways. Um, and so um, I thought there could be a rather net uh, indeed um, uh, being spun when one addresses the issue of populists in power, uh, populists of uh, uh, part of the government. Uh, and that leads me to a second point, and maybe it's unfair, because I realize uh, probably when your book came out, uh, the literature I'm going to mention now either wasn't yet published or was only very recently published. But for me, one of the core books in the populism discussion, which strangely enough, is not sufficiently picked up, it seems to me, is Andrew Arata, Gene Cohen's book on populism and civil society. And one thing that I find extremely useful there is the way they, uh, they don't talk about populists in opposition and populists in power only, but they uh, depict a, re a set of stages, so to speak, which are not necessarily uh, stages that fo follow the one after the other, but that, that indicate different types of engagement uh, of populists with the institution, with political power. And that starts with spontaneous grassroots, uh, Cinque Stella type of five star movement type of populism towards organized civil society, towards populists in government, to populist being the government. And then, of course, the ultimate stage, if you have a, 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 how to put it, a more negative view of populism to court would be a populist regime, populism taking over democracy, and then ultimately probably f flowing, into, uh, flowing into authoritarianism of some kind. Uh, I thought this is, uh, and I still think I use it a lot in my teaching as well, this is a very powerful way of looking at populism. Um, and that also brings me to what I think is an extremely um, interesting and in some ways more original literature on populism. Uh, Arato's book is a contribution to that, but there are other books coming out now on, on civil society and populism. For instance, recent work by Jeffrey Alexander on, uh, I don't like the term, but uh, for want of a better word, on civil society, uh, the relation between populism, uh, specific positions on democracy and civil society. Uh, and also there, I think there's still a lot to be said and analyzed and researched on how also populists in power keep on having relations to uh, non-institutional actors. Of course, in your book, you uh, interestingly do an ethnographic approach, et cetera, which is, is as I read it, more about how do you mobilize citizens? Uh, but there's also this other story about populists being in power and then 
creating sometimes, as in the case with Orban and the civic circles, civil society organizations that play a kind of intermediary role uh, to mobilize society. And I think that's, that's an under-discussed dimension of populism, uh, which would need much more attention, particularly because I think of the global right dimension. So Trump is one of your cases, of course, and Trump is clearly linked uh, to not only American domestic civil society, but to huge transnational networks that play a major role in, in, in Europe, in Latin America, and in, in, in a whole range of dynamics around uh, populism and power. Uh, and that also then, that brings me to a question that I don't think you could have answered and nobody still has yet an answer, but I think we should also go beyond populism in power as meaning populists in government. There are all kinds of other ways you can have influence. I just mm -hmm. finished a paper on uh, amicus curiae interventions by right-wing conservative actors related to populist in power uh, at the European Court of Human Rights. I mean, I can't gauge exactly what their influence is, but they definitely do have an influence on judgments of an important court like the European Court of Human Rights. So in that sense, power should, I think, be taken also much less in a literalistic sense or in a, a <clears throat> political sense uh, and in a more sociological, critical, socio-theoretical manner. It can uh, play out in all kinds of different ways. Of course, some of that comes back in your work on discourse analysis and how you interpolate, etc. But I think more could still be uh, sad about this indeed, uh, also in terms of what, what kind of role civil society plays. Um, and again, uh, um, a further point then, and I already mentioned this a bit in the context of the Latin American and, and uh, East Central European cases, is I believe that one of the core issues with populists in power is exactly the constituent dimension. It seems to me what makes populism particularly interesting and worrisome is opening up uh, uh, debates on constituent dimensions of democratic societies. In other words, uh, trying to change the constitutional parameter. It's not by coincidence that Maloney in Italy is now discussing uh, il premiato, the idea to make the prime minister the central uh, role in the Italian democratic system. And you see this in many different uh, cases. Of course, Orban is a case in point. He has been, I mean, this is his, uh, as you might have uh, seen recently, when he sees a problem in Hungary, five minutes later, he comes with a constitutional amendment. Uh, that's his way of doing politics. Uh, but that's, I think, one of the core issues with populism. It is not anymore about playing and kind of political ideological game within the framework of democracy. It's about changing the rules of the game. It's about creating something else than liberal representative democracy uh, in a classical sense. And that seems to me um, as important, at least, as the mobilizational capacity uh, of populists in power. Um, and I think I spoke already much too long, but let me get the to a final point. As I said, I really appreciate the discourse uh, analysis, uh, which is sometimes uh, something I do in my work as well. Um, but I wonder, and I think you said it at the end uh, in your concluding remarks, I wonder to what extent we shouldn't be going beyond uh, the aesthetics, uh, the performativity, uh, the, 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 let's say the, the effectual dimensions, and also squarely put into the mix political discourse, or let's make it much clear, political ideology. Because it seems to me, even if the Mude type of debate has a bit muddled the waters uh, in terms of what ideology is, how it works, etc., it seems to me that particularly on the political right, uh, one can explain an awful lot by looking at political ideological positions in terms of what happens in terms of uh, policy making, in terms of constitutional uh, reform and changes. Uh, and maybe I'm a bit obsessed uh, by studying 
on civil society, the global right, etc. But I mean, if you look at the the rights agenda of the global right, this is what they continuously try to put into practice. Sometimes in a more hidden manner, uh, like for instance in Italy, to say that abortion should be abolished is a bit complex. But there are all kinds of other ways in which you can stimulate that, and that's exactly what they do. And so. Again, if you talk about populism in power, it seems to me extremely important to look also very specifically at those political ideological dimensions of populist discourse and to see how they actually translate that into to actual uh, usage of political power. Let's put it like that. I will stop there. Uh, uh, and I just want to thank you again for having me participating in this. I, I, I really enjoyed the book. But uh, I also want to raise some issues. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Blocker, for, for the presentation. You perfectly uh, respected the time of uh, 15 minutes, so 40 minutes and uh, 48 seconds. Um, so uh, thank you very much. So now I uh, immediately uh, give the floor to our uh, other discussant, uh, Professor Vergara, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Essex Business School, and she has a PhD in political theory with specialization in constitutional law from Columbia University and was awarded the Marie Curie Fellowship at the University of Cambridge for her work on uh, plebeian rights. In addition to her work in academia, uh, she is an advisor to international and grassroots organizations on civil and political rights and on procedures and institutions for direct deliberative democracy. And her articles and interviews have been featured in mass media outlets just, uh, such as New Left Review, Politico, Revista Plebeia, and 74. Uh, so, uh, Professor Vergara, now uh, the floor is yours and you have 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, so first, I wanted to uh, clarify that as a good populist, I have subverted the norms. So I asked to to speak last because I thought I was going to be more critical than Paul. <laughs> um, so um, thank you uh, for inviting me to uh, comment uh, on the book. Um, I was first uh, kind of baffled because um, we have known each other for a while. Uh, uh, and also my, my work on populism was not in the book. So I was kind of like, okay. Um, what is my role uh, in discussing this book? So first I want to say that the book um, does a great job at the discourse analysis and the ethnographic you know, research. Um, this is something that was overdue in the sense that um, in populism studies tends to be very kind of uh, light uh, and that uh, this book basically gives you uh, the, the, um, uh, the discourse and the rhetoric and the performativity of this kind of two strands that for me are completely incompatible uh, of course, if you have uh, read anything on me on populism, I, I basically disagree with the central definition that has been put out uh, in the last 20 years. Yeah? So um, I am a historian of political thought in addition to kind of political theory. So I come from that, from that uh, perspective. So my comments will, will come from there. Um, but first I want to address the central uh, uh, core of the, of, of the book in terms of putting out the kind of definition. And that you, you said at the beginning uh, that populism is defined by a people centrism and an anti elitism. Okay. And this is something that everybody seems to agree, but there's no really an analysis of what that means. Um, and it's an abstraction, right? And part of uh, the problem is that when we talk about people centrism, who is the people? In the people, as a, as a term, etymologically and historically speaking, has always have had two different interpretations or, or constructions. One is the people as nation, as ethnos, as you clearly say in the book and repeatedly. So this is something that is a, is a good thing because the book, you know, it, it brings all the contradictions, does not shy away from the contradiction. And I was a little bit disappointed at the end of the book because I thought that by the last, I don't know, chapter, you would say, well, yeah, all these analysis have, you know, concluded that basically this definition is faulty and we need to go look elsewhere, but that didn't happen. Um, so, the people has is constructed as the nation and also as the plebs, right? The people as the common people, as the people without rights, without privilege. And this is something that comes from Aristotle to today, right? And we, you can trace the idea or interpretation of the people 
um, um, through the elites. And of course, uh, Ranciere talks about this, uh, about how basically even populism is always looked from the top and anything that is outsider is called populist, right? So it is a kind of a, a pejorative term, but we don't go into what is actually meant by people centrism. So for me, analytically and using Ranciere, um, I have um, argued that basically populism uh, or, or the people centrism of populism needs to be divided in these two ways of organizing the political, right? The people, the people as plebs, as, as Lanidis has also said, has a very kind of fragile and ephemeral a, a, a master frame, right? It's something that is based on class, based on an exclusion, on a subalterity, right? And therefore, it's very difficult to maintain. It doesn't exist. You need to reconstruct it because we are atomized in, in kind of the, the society and even before, right? So you need to construct this plebeian identity. However, the people at, at Ethnos is based on something that actually exists, which exists, quote unquote, right? That is the ethnic group, right? And that ethnic group has is exclusionary, has borders, and according to Ranciere, is the logic of police. Because when you have a people constructed based on ethnic markers, then you have an in and out, and you need to police that in and out. So for him, uh, racism and this idea of nationalism and uh, ethno-nationalism is inherently a police-like ideology, right? That is cannot, and of course, against freedom, right? Against a, uh, a emancipation. So you cannot have, at least from my perspective, uh, a term that refers to both the people as the disruption of the logic of police, like the, the, you know, the bottom up, right? The, the people that have no part, as Rancière says, and on the other hand, the people as police in the same concept. It just doesn't make much sense. So um, looking at historically, we see that the people, the, the uh, populism as a movement that uh, was uh, mo in the modern, modern times was born in Russia and then uh, it was uh, uh, expressed in the United States with the People uh, Party that you, uh, that you address in the book and then jumps in Latin America and we have a lot of that, right? And why do we have that? Is because there is so much inequality and so much exclusion, right? So therefore there is kind of a, a ground that is real that allows for the construction of these people, right? And part of the problem of kind of agglutinating um, populism with nationalism or ethno-nationalism that, you know, is proto-fascist in a way, is that, uh, that uh, you kind of abstract uh, the people uh, from the reality. And we get analysis of, for example, Syriza saying, well, Syriza was against the media or, you know, had to subvert the media and therefore is illiberal. Right, because uh, there was no it was attacking constantly the media. However, if we see the reality, like ninety percent of you know the, the the media is actually right wing or against you know the left or the people. However, when you see a Trump, <laughs> so the liberal media is attacking me and media is censoring me. Well, they have their own channel. They have Fox News, so they are the hegemonic narrative. So the idea of the exclusion and the discrimination coming from the media and all this kind of censorship is not really real. Is constructed, right? So uh, again, when when Hugo Chavez, the Pope, uh, brought him, uh, they had all the problems with the TV licenses because all the licenses were in the hands of conservatives. So how do you actually speak to the people uh, and and pass your message? So you have a battle with the media that is real because it is based on material condition. It's an ol oligopol oligopoly, right? So you need to kind of address the reality and not just the constructed reality. We need to kind of like make those those uh, those bridges. You do a good job at kind of uh, um, setting the real economic background, for example, for Greece. But then you say, well, the, the, the Greek nation was constructed as a subaltern, you know, subject within the European Union. Well, the Greece is in a subaltern position for real. So this is this is a, this is not something that is constructed as the way that Trump constructs the um, the subalterity of the white uh, Americans, right? That doesn't exist really. It's being contested by a uh, diversity and other things are not in a, in, in a position of dominance anymore. But it is a very different reality, one of the real underdog and the other of the supreme race or the majority or the people that are in control that are losing their dominance. And therefore, the discourse is really, really different. So I think there is a need to actually separate those two forms of constructing the people, one that is based on the plebeian subject and the other on the ethno-nationalist or the ethnic subject, because there's a very different logic, one of subalterity and inclusion and democracy, and the other of uh, exclusion and uh, dominance, right, and supremacy, right? 
one of the critiques that I have uh, throughout the book uh, is with your understanding of uh, the the people on Trump in, in Trump's uh, camp, because you talk about the industrial workers, right? And studies have shown that basically the main constituent of Trump were not the working classes, were the middle classes, the white middle classes. And therefore, people started talking about the white working class as the constituents of Trump. So we, when you kind of only say the industrial workers, you are erasing the fundamental part of, you know, the construction of the people as the Americans as always white, right? That there's like a, the dog whistles and all these things that came in the discourse that you don't get into, that that would be also interesting. What do they mean when we talk about the globalists and, you know, and the un-Americans that you, you, you kind of um, talk a little bit about that, but there are other things that are left unsaid that within the context are understood as you know, it connected to you know the white American uh, ethnographic uh, uh, ethno ethnos in a way. So this is something that I think we need to kind of uh, separate, and and it needs to be more analytical. And when we try to just um, define populism as a performativity or a rhetoric or a narrative or something that is just um, as a layer of politics, then we risk agglutinating things that don't have much to do with each other. And um, just we just we try to put them together uh, because it, it fits the um, people centrism and the anti elitism. Let me go to anti elitism now. So the people centrism needs to be connected to the material and to the, these different constructions. And then the el the anti elitism is also in this way. So if we look at um, historically, the anti elitism of populism was always against the first the plutocracy and then the oligarchy. Right? And this is not only elite, like the elite, because we have seen, especially in Latin America, but in the beginning with Russia as well, the intellectuals played a, a great role allying with the people and the populace in a way in government and to craft their programs. Chavez brought famously many intellectuals to his, 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 his um, close group, right? So it is not an anti-elitism, it's an anti-oligarchic, a tendency basically that we see that the, there are people with power with material power that are being dominant and the people are being oppressed and this is not something imaginary it's something that is really happening so when we talk about elitism again we say cultural elites and you know wealth elites and all together and they're not the same because the elite is not a homogeneous group so we need to kind of um, tease out and then when we do that we can see that how can a billionaire be you know talking against his own class of course it's all this dison dissonance that uh, we see in especially in trump um that is not really congruent right with 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 his politics um and then uh, my other comment that i have um well that also relates to, to my work is the idea of ideology that populism as an ideology and, and and paul talked about a little bit about this but um you dismiss very rapidly that populism is not an ideology without any discussion whatsoever, because the literature today does not discuss it at all. They immediately pass to an outcome or to a strategy or to a performativity and a discourse, but not as a form of ideology. And, and my uh, and my work in the history, history of political thought, I have traced populism as a form of plebeian ideology that, of course, as any ideology does not have specific set policies, but they are within you know, a realm of possibility. For example, in the Roman Republic, one of the first populists, we call it Popularis by Plato, where the, not all the tribunes of the plebs, so not all the representatives of the people were populist, only the ones that were radical in terms of like they went against the status quo and in a dangerous manner, right? So the, 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 the Gracchi brothers that famously put forward uh, the agrarian reform and wanted to expropriate the oligarchy of the lands that they had Ill, uh, illegally occupied, those were, uh, in Plato's eyes, the populists, because they were the only ones that were pushing for the actual benefit, material benefits of the people, and not just representing and reproducing the status quo, which is dominant, right? So from then on, you have kind of a, a, a kind of a policy realm, a, a, a policy, a set of policies that are connected to populism. Lenin famously, when talking about the populists in Russia, said that populism was a petit bourgeois ideology because populists didn't want to abolish the private property. They wanted inclusion into the system of private property. They want everybody to be a property owner. So therefore, they were um, they were excluded from the kind of more socialist, or say they were kind of like non-scientific, right? The same happened in in the U.S. 
with that, a people's party. That, uh, when we talk about transgressive norms, the transgression was against the ruling power. So uh, famously, Mary Elizabeth Lees said, we need to raise more hell and less corn. You know, these were the agricultural workers, the, 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 the yeoman farmers that were against the commercial elite. So there was very fiery uh, language, but not what Trump and you very beautifully describe all the kind of like the low that the, the in, in kind of populist low uh, or, or within this this kind of bag is, is put forward. Um, Trump, I don't know, I haven't read uh, Ostegi's uh, uh, work in, you know, in depth, but it, it, it strikes me that you cannot put in the same low bag wearing, a, you know, a funky shirt or no tie to insulting people because that is what Trump does. It's like, it's not, he's wearing a tie. He's wearing a full suit. He's he's performing in a in his in, in, in a very kind of um, establishment way. If you look at him, but then what he says is in a bully behavior, right? You're insulting other people. You're lacking respect, and that is something that people want to say, but they don't say, right? He is just a uh, coarse and vulgar, but vulgar in a manner not as you say, for example, that Cipras didn't speak English. For me, it's like, this is a class marker. That is not a populist thing, you know? It's not his fault, you know, that he was not part of the elite and didn't, you know, learn English since he was very young and therefore he speaks very badly. That you cannot say that that is populist in a way. It's, it's kind of stretching it, right? And then saying that it, 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 all the misogynists and all the, all the kind of bad language that, um, that it, um, Trump speaks is actually part of the law of populism. What is the law? Is really being uh, a disrespectful to others part of you know a plebeian um, a identity of the law, uh, or is something that we are judging the law from above in a way? Again, right. So uh, this is something that that we, what is our position as social scientists in a way to look at what is happening and judge the language, right? Um, and finally, um, I want to. Um, uh, Talk a little bit about uh, the context and where do you you know you you, you start your analysis or your the focus right because you, when we talk about for example Trump you say that he's a celebrity and all these things but he was he ma was made famous by firing people on TV so if that is like his vulgarity and his disrespect is populist so he's a populist subject then he has always been populist before after you know it's not about politics at all he just brings what he already cultivated at the tv level to the political scenario right so um it, it, what do we mean by kind of like this this style and of course he's the master of branding you talk about him liking you know um fast food but this is not only about the food of the people because fast food in America is part of the cultural identity. So hamburgers were invented, supposedly, in Germany, whatever, but it, it is a marker of, you know, the American culture. So therefore, when he is eating Kentucky Fried Chicken or, you know, McDonald's, he's sending a message about, you know, what is to be American, in a way. It's not just being low, in a way, but just eating, you know, the, the, the things that people that with no money eat, eat, right? So there's all the branding purposes that it needs to be taken with a, a, more, a more critical lens, I would say. Um, and then um, the construction of this movement of Trump, uh, the, the Tea Party, for example, you, you very briefly it, it, it kind of like touch in the Tea Party. However, the Tea Party was financed. There was um, a, a, the evangelical Christians have been brought into the, the, the mix in a way. And this has been a strategy that has been replicating in Latin America. So, for example, the evangelical Christians have summits in which Bolsonaro and the far right people in, in Chile go and they have a strategy. And I think your analysis would benefit very much by incorporating resource mobilization theory from social movements in terms of how do you use actually organizations that exist to create an identity or to um, um, allow for a consciousness. For example, in the civil rights movement, you had uh, the churches, the black churches being the vehicle for, you know, the uh, the opening up of uh, the civil rights uh, era, right? Uh, without that, you wouldn't have the civil rights movement. Today, I would say without the evangelical churches preaching, you, you did a very good job at actually seeing how they actually fed this kind of ideology into the people, right? Their, their, their constituents, they were kind of fabricating an ideology. And, and this is something that needs to be more scrutinized in a way of how this kind of a, a charismatic leader is actually a, created in a way that is not just spontaneous, right? Um, and uh, 
Professor Vergara, can you yes, move towards done. to the I'm conclusion? Thank you very much. Yes. Um, so one thing that I want to highlight that was the most interesting thing for me is one uh, is the um, uh, diagram you have in page uh, 201, which basically um, uh, looks at the connections between the different constituents of uh, populism. And you conclude, and I did that editing here, <laughs> industrial workers for Trump are the white, <laughs> white working class. But basically you conclude that there's no connection between these different constituents in the far right far right populism, right? On, the, on, on that, uh, on that uh, way of constructing, that you can just kind of uh, have an identification with the leader, but without any connection, right? And this is very interesting. However, in the, uh, in, in the, in the left side, it's always kind of a solidarity and horizontal relations. So it's more, more a coherent constituent. So I think that is worth exploring more. And um, I, I think it would benefit for me, at least, uh, as a political scientist, uh, I, to look at the negative um, um, uh, example. So what would this book look like if you have brought people, socialists and far right, you know, uh, people in power and would have compared their rhetoric and performativity to really see where are the differences and where are the similarities? Because if you have more similarity with the far right and a very tenuous connection with populism, then they're not populists, they're really far right ethno-nationalists. And that is what we need to call them. Because if we keep calling pop a, a, a populist someone that is far right and is kind of ethno-nationalist and will be able to subvert as fascism against liberal rights and the rights of all, then we are really masking in a very, very dangerous you know, a way of labeling um, uh, this, this, uh, um, uh, these movements that could actually subvert uh, not democracy as we know it, electoral democracy, but really the rights of all and could be uh, kind of going into domination. So, thank you. So, uh, um, I would like to thank both uh, discussants uh, for uh, for the comment. Um, I would like to ask Jorgos whether he wants to reply first to, to them and mm -hmm. To, to start after, to open after the Q&A yeah. session. Sure, 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 sure. I'll start uh, with um, so. uh, saying a few things about the, the comments uh, I received. Uh, I cannot respond to everything because, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I filled uh, two pages uh, with, uh, with uh, comments here, but thanks to both. Uh, unfortunately for me, uh when when paul was uh giving the praise my 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 connection was was cut so i only heard the defects so uh, <laughs> so there's too many defects uh it seems uh yeah i mean uh let me start by saying uh something about uh the commentators uh, work uh, i think camilla's work was was incorporated uh, i hope i'm not mistaken in the in the very end uh before i i send off the the manuscript while polls uh, and actually both of them because of uh workload and and so on and so forth like i didn't have the chance while writing uh uh writing the the phd to probably delve into into their work um uh, which is definitely uh not something uh positive but uh i do admit that when the when i i send off these uh, when i finish this a uh, PhD, then I, I started reading the, their work and that's why uh, I invited them today uh, to this uh, um, discussion. So um, a few things about Paul's uh, uh, comments, uh, starting by whether uh, we still need to study populism in power, uh, haven't people already done that um, and so on and so forth, uh, isn't it sufficient? Um, I think, yes, people have uh, ex extensively studied populism in power uh, in Latin America. Uh, uh, in Europe, uh, not as much, uh, at least at the national level, which relates to another comment, you know, uh, that uh, I think was raised by uh, uh, by Camila. Um, pop for uh, In the European literature for a long period, uh, populism in parliament, populism in opposition, populism in the, in the regional level, uh, were uh, perceived as, as, as populists uh, in, in power. And I think this is the opportunity uh, given to us to study populists uh, in power at the national level in a very specific uh, uh, historical and political and economic uh, conjuncture, you know, at the, at the end of neoliberalism or at the start of uh, neoliberalism uh, collapse. Um, so um, 
that's one point why I continue studying uh, populist. And uh, another key point, uh, which covers a lot uh, of, of, of what Paul uh, raised as, as, as concerns uh, as que or questions. And I do understand uh, that there's uh, many things that are not covered, like policy and so on and so forth. But I, I think it was very, very uh, clear uh, why, why I wanted to study uh, populism power in terms of uh, discourse, uh, performativity and identification. And this is why uh, these words are, are, in, are in the cover, in the title uh, as well. Because I think this thing gives, uh, gives a way out of this uh, is it a strategy that fails? Is it a necessarily authoritarianism? Uh, and and takes the debate back to the very core of of, of populism, which of course Camilla uh, uh, disagrees with people centrism and anti elitism uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, which of course I share her critique, but I see some use there. And going back to this uh, definition, uh, at least sticks something uh, together. Uh, um, when it comes to the to the debate in in, in populism studies and, and 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 political science, so uh, yeah, in a way, um, I have a theoretical uh, a theoretical interest to uh, pursue uh, uh, this study through through uh, focusing only on discourse performativity uh, identification, and in many ways, I am very uh, provocative. Uh, and I understand that there are limitations, but I deliberately do not want to uh, focus on on policy just because I want to construct uh, this very argument that you cannot define populism posteriori. You know, like most people in the literature, uh, you should know it. They see oligarchs and they say, ah, OK, populists, what do they do in power? And they name all the things that oligarchs do. Uh, uh, in, in power and autocrats and authoritarians uh, and and then uh, this relates with uh, with uh, the last uh, point um, Camilla uh, raised that populism serves as a euphemism uh, for something else uh, to cover up uh, fascism to cover up authoritarianism to cover up uh, uh, the far right and I think this element uh, this element that Camilla raised in in the very end I think. I raise it uh, throughout uh, throughout the text, uh, especially when it comes to the far right. Like we need to uh, speak things uh, um, with their uh, name. And of course, uh, I appreciate uh, Paul's comment on um, on uh, on uh, my work on, on on discourse. But of course, discourse uh, is not just uh, language, right? It has a sense of uh, materiality uh, as well which is uh, thoroughly uh, discussed uh, in the book. So going beyond aesthetics, yeah, of course, I'm up for uh, checking the policy that uh, populists uh, do. I'm up for examining whether uh, uh, someone um, we call um, a populist in power, let's think of uh, uh, Chavez, what, what policy he does and what is the, the effects he has on uh, on, uh, on on institutions, I'm very up for it. As a political scientist, I'd be very very happy to explore these questions, but strategically also disentangling them with uh, from 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 populism for strategic uh, and theoretical reasons that are very much connected with this uh, provocation, uh, which is the core argument uh, of of uh, of my book. I do discuss why I don't choose other actors like uh, like uh, Orban and issues are not just uh, uh, language or the conjuncture, the specific conjuncture that I am interested in. Um, uh, also, what I what I claim at some point is that it is questionable whether people like uh, Orban uh, are populists now or are still populists. Maybe at some point they were they were populist, but is there the people there really? People as an empty signifier, in a way, or is it like a very fixed uh, identity of the people, very nationalist in a way that maybe we should give it another another name? This not to denounce uh, or dismiss the possibility of having populists that are flirting a lot with authoritarianism. No, but. Uh, it is an argument uh, in favor of 
you know, uh, giving priority to a, a first identity that these actors uh, may have, have and a secondary element, uh, maybe, you know, maybe populism appears uh, as a second um, as a second element. Of course, the idea of, um, you know, um, Yorgos, can you please move towards to the conclusion? Then we have enough time to also to oh, questions okay. from the audience. Yeah. Thank you. Sure, 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 sure. So just a, a few things uh, uh, on on the comments uh, Camila uh, uh, made. I think we we share a lot um, a common understanding between um, between us uh, about a few things like uh, people centrism and anti-elitism is not just uh, uh, an abstraction, but what uh, seems to be a, a disagreement among us, but I do not think it's a disagreement in a way, because, you know, this exclusion from the media that I do, I do agree that uh, with you that uh, Trump's uh, friends are owning the media. Uh, and of course, there's some uh, difference in terms of uh, materiality here and who owns the media and who is a real uh, plebeian uh, subject and, and, and who's not. I don't, I don't, I don't. I don't don't present things uh, between a left uh, plebeian populist and a right wing exclusionary populist uh, in a very symmetric way. I don't think uh, that's the case and I don't agree with it uh, uh, politically or, or theoretically. But uh, going back to the very aim of, of this uh, discourse theoretical um, uh, uh, work, um, it is very important to like take the discourse uh, of what they say uh, very seriously. Uh, in terms of political uh, uh, science and uh, analytics and, and, and so on and so forth, like we to be consistent uh, where, where to focus. What do they say? Of course, we can interpret them. But what is more interesting for me is not whether Trump really owns the media or his friend, uh, but how he navigates this contradiction of being rich but appealing, but appealing uh, to, the, to the poor. Uh, and of course, I agree with you that uh, industrial workers are not for Trump. And there's this element of uh, a sociological analysis shows that uh, his demographic is much more white, much more rich, much more uh, middle class. But I'm not interested to uh, go behind and, 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 and see who they really are. There are other studies uh, doing that. What I'm interested in is uh, to who he's trying to appeal, judging from, uh, from his own uh, uh, political discourse. And I also, in the same, in very same way, I agree with you uh, on, on your comment on, uh, on anti-elitism. Uh, and for this reason, again, I'm, 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 I'm showing, I'm trying to show who are the elites according to this uh, often, yes, very narrow uh, political uh, communication that wants to deflect in a way uh, the focus of, 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 of the people from who's the, uh, who's the elite. And again, in a very uh, similar manner, uh, you, you criticize me for uh, putting uh, the same law back um, uh, Trump and, 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 and Syriza. I don't think that's the case. I'm, I'm very careful in that. And uh, uh, you can see pages uh, 190, 195, how I differentiate um, uh, between the two and the two qualities. And also in the chapter uh, on Trump, I'm very careful saying that uh, being se sexist Therefore, uh, uh, maybe like uh, uh, having this uh, working class happy does, does not mean you're populist or does not mean that you're uh, working class, you know? I'm just trying to show how certain vulgar stuff uh, might, might, might resonate with the law and how the law ultimately may be fitting with this populism, uh, elitism uh, thing. I think I'm very careful in, uh, in, in kind of not doing the, the easy thing to say, if you're a sexist, the uh, working class, and whatever, you're there for a populist and, and plebe. And that's I'm I'm, I'm trying uh, to be much uh, much more uh, careful. And the same goes for Trump being a celebrity or Trump uh, liking um, uh, fast food and, and and so on and so forth. And uh, you made a very a very spot on uh, point here. Like fast food is not uh, a plebeian thing or a populist thing. Uh, it's a cultural thing. And this is exactly why this cultural thing of of the law in a way, um, because yes, I understand it's an American thing. So uh, it's an element of uh, universality here, uh, but still it's, you know, like this low culture in a way, it's a tradition, it's an everyday thing. It's not a, it's not a caviar or, or whatever. And it is through these uh, common terrain of culture that 
uh, political actors in general, not just populists, try to establish uh, hegemony. Then if we're trying to uh, focus on, on, on populists specifically, we try to see how uh, a specific type of food is more uh, people oriented or people centric than uh, than than um, elites. And of course, there's other comments on ideology that I think I I cover uh, quite a bit, uh, pages 24, 27, uh, and also in some food notes because this debate uh, I think it's it's quite you know we have discussed it uh, extensively and it takes uh, too much pages. But uh, yeah, your comments were uh, very much uh, constructive. Uh, in a way, I could have written uh, two more books ba based on this, or or maybe uh, not have written this book, uh, but uh, but another one. But uh, you know, it's impossible to uh, write uh, everything in a book. And uh, also, like <laughs> I wish you can acknowledge the strategic uh, reasons behind not uh, accepting to include everything. Um, and uh, I'll leave I'll leave it for uh, for, for uh, I'll leave it here, and uh, we can uh, discuss more later. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your reply. So we have uh, around half an hour uh, for questions from, from the audience. Uh, and then uh, we see whether there are others. So sorry, my name is Jock. I'm a first year PhD at um, Santana. Um, thanks for the presentation. The discussion was super interesting. Um, my question uh, is to do with um, the role of irony. I, I haven't read the book yet, um, so I'm keen to to read it, but I was I was just interested in in some of the ethnographic work you did in particular, whether you could pick up uh, a lack of a consciousness of the concept in those that you spoke to, but also irony as a tool to distinguish between what Camilla was talking about with respect to you know a Trumpian type populist figure and some of these uh, uh, or populist figure or some of the more left wing populist figures uh, in terms of, yeah, as a way of differentiating between the two, um, but more interested in whether you what you picked up when you were in the United States and, and doing your field work in Greece. Yeah. So if there are no other questions for now, I also uh, abuse my uh, role as chair and uh, just ask you two questions. One is uh, maybe uh, seems to be a bit obvious in light of the upcoming elections in uh, in the US. So how do you think uh, Trump's relationship with the people has changed over these four years of Biden's presidency? So whether we see some of the same patterns as uh, a couple of years ago, or so has, has something changed? Uh, and the other question regards uh, Greece, uh, and you uh, repeated uh, in the book uh, many times that uh, the Greek case is more inclusive in terms of people, and it's not really the people is not defined by uh, ethnic or nationalist features, and that it was the Syriza was rather inclusive towards, for example, migrants and refugees. And my, my main research is on uh, asylum law, and uh, so therefore my question comes rather naturally that because if we think of Greece and if I think of my uh, research in refugee law, Greece is always a negative example of pushbacks, dire living conditions, reception conditions, and all the hostility towards migrants and refugees, especially after uh, the, the 2015 uh, crisis. Uh, and how, uh, so, and there were, of course, a lot of cases before the European Court of Human Rights, the, also the Court of Justice, uh, regarding the violation of uh, human rights in these camps. And also, uh, there are some, uh, some instances where also uh, the pushbacks were uh, brought before these courts. So, uh, my question is, uh, how could this political narrative of Syriza be reconciled with, uh, with uh, reception and uh, uh, living conditions and those of migrants and refugees and Greece and also the sh general shortcomings of the asylum system, were, which were not really uh, remedied in the last years, uh, we can say so. Uh, thank you very much. If there yeah. are no questions for now, I think I, I can give you the floor. And in the meantime, maybe others uh, will jump in the discussion. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'll start uh, with the last uh, question, uh, Camila. Uh, um, 
Uh, asked, uh, so yeah, I, I, I highlight this uh, inclusive uh, element, in inclusive nature of uh, of Syriza's uh, populism is rooted in its uh, ideology. Uh, we know from uh, Bobbio and others uh, that uh, you know left wing ideology tends to be more inclusive, more egalitarian in in terms of distribution of uh, resources. Uh, that's just for analytical uh, purposes uh, I'm, I'm mentioning. And this, uh, just to mention also that this influences also the way uh, Syriza talks about the nation. Uh, and there is this debate uh, in, in Southern Europe, but also uh, Southern America. Um, in Southern Europe is mostly framed in terms of uh, patriotic uh, left politics. Not many leftists uh, agree with it. But uh, due to this patriotism, uh, you can see like uh, someone talking uh, about the nation, uh, understood um, not as a as la patria in a way, not as a nation of of uh, uh, homogeneity um, uh, and 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 so on and so forth. So, so that's a clear uh, uh, distinction. But of course, there is also this uh, contradiction uh, talking about uh, immigrants uh, and migrants in. in uh, uh, in that way, but not being uh, fully uh, in line with this uh, when you do uh, policy. And um, uh, I think this was the, the case with Syriza as well, to an extent, but one has to acknowledge, uh, one has to acknowledge the, first of all, the difference um, between uh, Syriza in terms of migration policy and other right-wing governments that came, uh, uh, that were before or came after it. Uh, so Mitsudagi's government is is much more uh, um, doing many more uh, pushbacks. Uh, it has uh, harsher uh, borders and so on and so forth. So while Syriza was disappointing uh, to uh, its supporters, uh, according to the the, the interviews uh, uh, I took, there is this uh, acknowledgement that it's better to have uh, this leftist, who is of course disappointing, not very in line with this radical ideology. Uh, but at least has more like a human uh, humanitarian sort of discourse and policy than uh, um, uh, right wing uh, government. So that's the the, the main uh, distinction. Syriza was uh, softer in terms of that, and I think I think it does it does play a role materially. Um, you know, uh, it was not perfect, but it was it was uh, slightly more um, uh, quite quite more uh, humanitarian. Trump, uh, Trump post uh, 2020, uh, it's a complicated uh, uh, story, I think. Uh, of course, um, we expect some uh, some um, people from the from his party to be kind of uh, being not so so uh, sure that this should be the, the candidate based on uh, legal reasons based on uh, rational reasons and so on and so forth but this does not say much because there's other people who are not part of the Republican Party who are mobilized uh, they the grassroots uh, radical right that finally found uh, a political uh, figure in the mainstream to be uh, represented with uh, but also just to highlight that even within the Repub Republican Party that was not initially for Trump at the end uh, in 2020, they supported overwhelmingly this candidate, and they're likely to do so if he's uh, winning the the, the internal uh, um, uh, the internal uh, race because Trump um, said. So the the key point here, uh, is that yeah, some people get alienated with Trump, but some get very excited with him. And uh, we can only wait to see uh, what's going to happen. I cannot give a, a, an answer. Uh, Jock's uh, comment. Yeah, uh, you meant like lack of uh, consciousness about the concept of, uh, of populism, not irony, right? Yeah, the idea of Trump being a billionaire and also a friend of the, the downtrodden, that kind of an idea. Mm. Okay, that's, so that's a, a different question in a way, because uh, most Trumpians, for example, I, I I I I interviewed. They were very fond of Trump because they downgraded uh, or they downplayed these, uh, let's say, class differences um, uh, between them being like uh, not not rich, uh, being like common people in many in many in many occasions. 
because they, they, they were mobilized mainly on cultural issues, on cultural access. Uh, they didn't, for, for the same reason, they didn't even care uh, whether Trump was, uh, you know, politically incorrect and vulgar, whether he could marry uh, three, four times. Uh, and at the same time, he was pushing for, uh, you know, very uh, Christian values uh, sort of agenda. So they were, they, they just downplayed these things because, uh, and that's a, in a way a rational uh, thing, because this guy was giving them what they wanted. Uh, they were able to turn the blind, blind eye uh, towards uh, his past, towards his, his character uh, because of this. Um, but if it comes uh, to the way that I understood the question, lack of consciousness of populism, yes, I did interview the person who was writing um, uh, uh, Tsipras' uh, speeches uh, for some time, and he was like, populist? No, he's not populist. He's very rational, very pragmatic, very nice, very uh, clever. Because he was also thinking uh, populism in, in, in an anti-populist way. Uh, so this shows how uh, we don't really share uh, uh, concepts uh, as experts with uh, actors in the, in, in the field. Uh, uh, role of irony, like concepts, humor and stuff, it is very present and it's, it's very um uh very topical to research uh these issues and i see emerging research uh um focusing on, on on humor and irony and all these things but i must admit it's very difficult to capture or like to write it down uh in a way that uh it resonates because you, you speak a language right and you, you you study an actor closely you can understand it but it's another story on how to uh, put it down on paper and, and, and transmit it but uh, uh, to your audience. But uh, definitely there, there was uh, a lot of uh, irony and many other cultural, culturally influenced uh, rhetorical devices that were used by, by politicians. And it's often uh, very important to, to transmit the message and it's, it's, it's important to capture them uh, uh, as well. Uh, about case selection and, and, and um, yeah, I do agree that there are many different um, uh, differences between the two actors. Uh, just to highlight one uh, that was uh, uh, related with uh, Camila's comments uh, in a way, uh, the constituencies that Trump uh, tried to appeal to were in a way manufactured by him and by his discourse. So evangelicals for Trump, of course, is the, the Christian right blog that is very present and very influential in the US. But all of these Latinos for Trump, black people for Trump and stuff, they were uh, top down created um, uh, uh, by Trump in his discourse. So he tried to create this, uh, these communities uh, and, and, and mobilize them. And if you if you went on his uh, website before 2020, you would see like the, the same font, same logo, same colors that he used for Trump 2020. Uh, but then it was like uh, black people for Trump, Latinos for Trump, and you could click there and you could get in touch with these movements, but he created them. On the contrary, uh, Syriza did not, of course, Syriza created uh, discursively through communication. Uh, these movements, but in a different way. Uh, what I mean, uh, it, it gives sense of belonging or sense of uh, of identity to these movements, but demographically and sociologically, uh, the different movements in the two cases, uh, the, the different movements in the in the case of Tra or of Syriza uh, were pre-existed. Uh, Syriza just gave a perfect framing uh, to mobilize them. So despite this, I think there are these uh, commonalities and um, uh, that uh, and differences that we should uh, take into into account. Maybe um, we'll elaborate uh, later if this if, if this time. And uh, Trump's re religious uh, argument, yes, Trump's not religious, but he can play the card because it sells. But on the other hand, we need to uh, uh, understand that the, the evangelical right or the Christian right uh, is a very important player in American uh, uh, politics. Um, they have a, a, a huge history um, and there's so many books about the, the language, uh, the vernacular language of, 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 of evangelical uh, preachers and uh, how they were one of the first to go on the first uh, radio shows and, and speak and stuff. And there is also a connection with populism in, 
in much of the literature. Uh, I'll leave it. Uh, I leave it here. Um, and if there's more questions, I'm happy to answer or clarifications. Uh, so I don't know if there are other questions also from uh, on behalf of uh, our discussion. So of course, uh, if you would like to uh, provide another uh, round of answers or, or comments, uh, but uh, so um, I. I don't know if uh, anyone wants to jump in. Uh, then uh, I think we can conclude. Also, Giuseppe, do you agree that we can conclude here um, the this uh, uh, this webinar? And I would like to thank uh, all of you, uh, Jorgos, for his presentation, and Professor Vergara and Boca for their comments. Uh, and we can, I think, stop the registration as well.